our state and our country. We don't take it lightly. Come together during this week and make things happen. Before we dive in, we want to say a special thank you to our 2020 Denver Startup Week sponsors who make it all possible. Thanks to our title sponsors, Downtown Denver Partnership, JP Morgan Chase, Prologis, and Zero. And our track sponsors who have made all of the great content you're hearing today possible. Battery 621 and the Public Works, Capital One Cafe, Colorado Lending Source, Friday Health, Quizlet, Exactly, Zayo, and Zestful. Our headline event sponsors are bringing the excitement to all of you this week. Thank you to Wix, Kenzen, MAPR Agency, Obsidian HR, Kickstart Fund, Promontory Mortgage, Molson Coors, and Comcast. Finally, thank you to our partner and member sponsors. They're all listed on the screen. Thank you for your support of Denver Startup Week. Now, make things happen. We're back. We're ready to rock the next hour uh, with one of the most incredible uh, innovation authors in the world right now, Ms. Arlen Hamilton. Um, first, a big thank you for MAPR Agency. Um, you got to see their video at the pre-roll at the very beginning of the session. MAPR Agency has been an incredible partner all week long. They've helped us produce these sessions. Uh, they've been behind the scenes curating our questions. And most importantly, they've just been a great Denver uh, startup ecosystem partner as we've been able to put together all this free content. Some quick housekeeping before I introduce Arlen. Um, this session is 100% about you. Denver Startup Week has always been for the people, by our community, for the future of our startup leaders and small business owners. And with that in mind, want to make sure that you start to put your questions in the chat function. And our team at MAPR Agency will curate those questions with Arlen Hamilton about midway through the session. Today's format, we're going to learn a little about Arlen's background, talk deeply about her book, and most importantly, the impact that she wants to, to push onto the world with all of her awesome work. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Arlen Hamilton. And for those who don't know, um, she built a venture fund from the ground up while homeless. She's a founder and managing partner of Backstage Capital, a fund that is dedicated to minimizing funding disparities in tech by investing in high potential founders who are people of color, women, and LGBT leaders across the United States and the world. She started from scratch in 2015 and now Backstage has raised nearly $12 million and invested in more than 130 startup companies led by underestimated founders. In 2018, Arlen co-founded Backstage Studio, which launched four accelerator programs for underestimated founders in Detroit, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and London. Arlen was featured on the cover of Fast Company Magazine in 2018 and was the first black woman non-celebrity to do so. And her book, which you're gonna hear about today, It's About Damn Time, is out on Ping, Penguin and Random House. Arlen, it's so awesome to have you here. Thank you for your incredible support of Denver Startup Week. Um, your leadership across the startup and innovation communities worldwide is inspirational. And we couldn't be more excited to uh, dive in to you, uh, your, your work and your future impact as you continue to set the stage for, for underestimated entrepreneurs around the planet. So to get started, uh, take us back, uh, paint us a picture, you know, of those early years. Um, you know, you, you mentioned you were homeless, you're sleeping at airports on food stamps, and you have a vision of being a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. When and how did that lightning hit? And, you know, uh, how did you know that was what you were supposed to be and do? <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. I've had a lot of fun. Uh, uh, and, uh, joining you all this week, um, it almost it almost feels like in person. <laughs> you know, again, it's, no, it's, it been, it's been six plus months, and I, I miss it. So it, it almost feels like that with this setup. So appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, uh, a few years ago, again, we we, we just celebrated our fifth year uh, on Tuesday of, of backstage being an official fund. So it's it's, it's gone by. It seems like a lifetime ago and it seems like a minute ago, right? And uh, a few years prior to that is when I, I kind of stumbled upon the understanding about the tech world 
that in the tech world that most of the funding that was supposed to go to uh, early stage companies getting started was going to a very specific subset and that was uh, white men. And it still is. I mean, the majority yep. still does go there, but the idea of it uh, just didn't make any, any logical sense to me. And so as an outsider observer, I was in Texas where I grew up uh, uh, at the time back in Texas, it just didn't make any sense. And so I, I started, you know, as a gay black woman, I started thinking about where does that leave people like me? Where, do, where are we supposed to fit into this, this picture? Because I was very excited about the future. I was very, and I still am very optimistic about the future. And it was no, there was no doubt that tech, uh, which is such a broad uh, word, right? But that tech and that innovative place was going to have something to, you know, a, a major effect, if not the biggest effect on our future. It's going to touch on things like sustainability and, and um, um, economic equality and, and uh, now more and more um, um, policy. And uh, not to mention things like um, autonomous vehicles and uh, AI, and where you've seen that in both cases, like autonomous vehicles have been known to not be able to see darker skin on humans. And don't you want, don't you want them to be able to see darker skin on humans? This is like, sure. you know, tons of, of metal going, you know, uh, down the street, plowing and these trucks and et cetera. And then with AI, um, that's even, I mean, that has so many more implications from the simplest form up until uh, what you see if you have the latest uh, uh, copy of Fast Company with Joy on the cover um, uh, talking about AI. Uh, so all of that, it was, again, I was an outsider. I wasn't really, um, I didn't really imagine at the time that I would be getting into tech or venture. But I saw that and I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I want to be in that world. And I want to be invited into that world and included in that world. And I also want so many more of us to be. And it doesn't make sense uh, the way that it's set up now. So that started me on a path to doing research and I you know, obsessively talking to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, different stakeholders, and then making the decision that I was going to have to um, start writing checks in order to be able to get my voice heard. Um, and so I, I set out to do that. And even though I was broke and, and had a lot of housing insecurity and a lot of food insecurity, I, I knew that, that it was my calling. It was pulling for me. You know, they, I, had, I had already started living my dream, which had been working in live music. Um, but my calling, it felt, was to get these, this access to, to uh, capital. And venture was the route that I chose to take for a few reasons. It wasn't that I I was five years old and said I want to be a venture capitalist when I grow. <laughs> so it's startup week. You know, when we talk about startups, um, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs and and those that are you know in the throes of trying to build businesses. Um, paint a picture of those early years for us before the hockey stick. I mean, you just celebrated your fifth uh, anniversary of backstage. But like 2015, 2016, like in the heart of the struggle, and I think as you put it, you know, mapping out, you know, becoming money, like yeah. what, what's, what, what was that like as an entrepreneur? And, you know, what, from a startup perspective, you know, how did you get Arlen Inc. started up? Well, I certainly feel like we're still, we, we haven't made it yet. We, we haven't, you know, it's not like I'm looking back on my life and saying, oh, that was, that happened. But <laughs> it's definitely different five years and four years ago. It was lean as lean. I mean, it's lean now, let's be honest, but it was really lean. It was like, um, it was like, because I've, I've, I've started companies and in, in initiatives before. So I can tell you, it was like the early days of starting a company. It's just that the, um, all of the, the things that you do to start a company, I feel are like magnified and kind of, um, repl you know, uh, replicated. So it's like a 10 X to me, in my opinion, it's been, it's been 10 X difficult to, to pull off because your product is a little different. You know, your product is money. Yeah. Your customers are other founders. Uh, your investors are LPs who, you know, it's, it's a, it's a different ball game, especially with investors who, who like the, the hunt. So if you know it's it's a little bit difficult talking you know 
telling investors, hey, let me invest your money. You know, so the fund, any fund that you know of that was built from scratch, that was that is less than um, fifty million dollars. Uh, there's probably a story there, unless they were unless they just kind of rolled out of bed at Stanford and, and had their dad write a check. There's probably a story. <laughs> and there are those too, believe me. Uh, but there's probably a story there, and it's probably one of, of grit and 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 um, no matter what the background is, you know. And so it's. It was, it was, you know, if I had a garage, it would have been a garage type of situation. You know, it was, uh, it was early days. In my case, it was really lean because I also had the personal um, uh, situation of, of being uh, without a, a permanent home and, and, and having no, no capital to, to think of. Once we got, once I was able to secure some capital for the fund, both investment capital and operational capital, uh, remained extremely lean, but hit the ground running because I had been for years preparing for that moment. So I always encourage people, no matter what situation they're in right now, to just stay ready, as they say. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. How long did it take from, uh, you know, as in your words, you know, sleeping at airports to getting that first check? And was it, was it, did, did, you are a, a master of relationships and building authenticity in your life. Was, was it something that you had queued up or did you have to talk to a lot of investors to get that first check and, and, and get the fund started? Yeah, the, the, the airport portion of it was in 2015, but I had been working on the fund since 2011, 12. So okay. for three and a half years, I had been um, from Texas mostly, um, I had been, you know, seeking capital and, and talking to, I, I don't know, I, I did not keep up with every conversation, which I probably should have, um, but it was definitely in the hundreds, if not more than that, of, of investors, angel investors, fund investors, family offices, etc. So it was a lot of that. And during that time, those three and a half, those three years that were not in California, it was uh, a combination of having a place with my mother, yeah. uh, going you know, in my 30s, going back to living with my mother uh, as roommates. Uh, it, it was a combination of that and then us losing that and then us like sharing a hotel room and paying it day to day when we could put the money together. Then it was like sleeping on couches and the both of us, you know, and at one point we were on the road. We, we just like rented a car and we just, you know, that was what we, that's where we were, that's where we landed. And it wasn't, um, it wasn't great. And then, and then, you know, uh, got myself, you know, one way ticket to, to California and uh, to go to a boot camp for investors that I wanted to get, you know, get myself into. And that's when the, the, the airport situation happened. And, and so, so it was, I, it was rare that I would tell somebody I was in that situation. I, you know, I may, I told a few people, a handful of people uh, over those three and a half years and, um, you know, still know those people today and, and very grateful to them. But for by and large, what I, what I was doing was I wasn't saying that because again, it's, it's what I, I try to practice what I preach. So I encourage people, I I've said, you know, getting a check is not about a sob story. Not to say that there's nothing, you know, taking away from the actual thing you're going through, because I was going through a real thing that still to this day, to this day affects me. To this day, I think about as I wake up, I think about the differences. Um, but but that is this is business, you know, and uh, and is not everyone else's problem. Uh, uh, so you know, you have to be really grounded, in my opinion, with what you're doing. And, you know, kind of try to separate business from personal in that way. And, you know, personal can seep into your thesis for sure. But, yeah. like, you know, paint the picture of why it's why your lived experience can be helpful to uh, making capital, you know, generating capital. Well, it seems like things move pretty quickly once uh, you're able to start to get that initial traction with the fund. Um, you know, next came the Venture Studio, the book we're going to talk about today. Uh, uh, national podcasts, obviously being on the front cover of uh, Fast Company magazine. How are these things related? Is it just was it was it like a, a, a was it was it something where there was a, a log jam and it broke and everyone said you know this message oh, no. or was it or was it lots of hard work and in each thing was meticulous like yeah how, how come together. I would have to say the latter. <laughs> you know it was you you say it's fast and I know that five years is 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 quick. 
in, yep. in the grand scheme of things, but it felt like swimming through molasses, you yeah. know, and it, it felt like every single step of it was, we had a lot of things, you know, over time I built up a team, one person, then five, and then bigger, and then smaller, and smaller. You know, so we had a lot of times where we would just get kind of high up. We would get like, oh, we've, we now we've gotten to something. And then it would just fall beneath us because something fell through. And so it was a lot of that. It was a lot of like climbing a mountain. And along the way, um, you know, you, to your question, um, I've had, I, there has been method to the madness, you know, even though things, you can't predict how things are going to go and you can't control how they're going to go. I did have a method to where I, the vision I saw. And yep. at first the vision was, it was simply uh, led by my idea of investing in a hundred companies by 2020. So I set that goal at 2014 and that was just my North star. And that's what I was going towards. And no matter what people said about it, that's where I was going. So that helped us have a vision of, okay, what are we here for? And what are we trying to do? We're trying to make investments. That's what we're doing. So everything kind of fed into that. 2018, summer of 2018 is when, uh, this is before the Fast Company cover. So it was it was almost like I kind of willed it to happen almost, right? Yeah. So um, at 2000, summer 2018, after we had reached 100 companies, um, that's when I said, okay, we, we have to think about uh, three you know, three pillars. Uh, uh, one is uh, vision, which is that vision of 100 companies and what other vision, what other those statements will be. One is execution, because 2015 and 2018 was all heads down execution, like you wouldn't believe, doing the work of a, of a decade in three years, essentially. And then that third pillar, in my view, as what was going to have impact was amplification. And so amplification, even though I didn't know what was about to happen, I said to our team, we were in Ireland, I remember saying it, amplification is that third pillar. And that is because we are the case study. Backstage is the case study. Yep. And we now need to take our the vision, the execution, and then wrap that in something that we can uh, get across to others so that they can replicate it, so they can understand it, they can pull data from it, et cetera. So then, you know, we had had a podcast going, the Bootstrap VC, uh, just an amazing uh, partner at Backstage at the time was Brian, uh, Brian Landers. And he was just an incredible uh, podcasting producer and uh, in, addition, in addition to so many other things. So we had this great podcast. Then, um, you know, uh, Gimlet came knocking earlier that year and said, hey, you know, we want to do a whole series about backstage and you. So Gimlet kind of opened up a lot of doors, uh, for better or for worse, you know, having somebody follow you for seven months is not the best thing in the world. But, it, <laughs> it, you know, I talk about it in the book, you know, the experience, the good and the bad of it, pros and cons. And so that was a, that was something. And then all of a sudden, I, I you know, I, I don't think I've ever said this, like, since it happened, like, at, publicly. But when the Fast Company cover, when they, um, when they, came to do like a, uh, the interview, I didn't know, I had no idea it was going to be a cover. Like I, you know, cause I was getting a lot of inbound interviews all the time, yeah. you know, it just comes in and we say, okay, what, what do we want to say yes to? And what do we, what doesn't, you know, impact. And so I was like, oh, cool. It's going to be a fast company. I love, like, that's my favorite magazine. That's so cool. I can't believe I'm going to be in the printed pages of fast company. So they sent someone, uh, Ainsley, they sent this uh, 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 journalist out to LA from New York and she was pregnant. And I didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, she was spending a day with me, right? And so I didn't think anything of it. And it was my, it was one of our partners, Christy, who said, Arlen, do you understand? They don't just send people across the country pregnant for like a page in Fast Company. Do you understand that? there's probably something more to this. I'm like, no, there's no way, there's no way. And then a, a few weeks later, they, they sent me a message. They said, uh, so you're gonna be in the cover of Fast Company. And that's what we had all planned, you know, this whole time. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me figure that out. So, so a lot of the, so a lot of people think that, uh, you know, the thing, you know, I speak so much and I get into all this, yeah. I think that I'm, I'm going out there and trying to get this. I don't spend any time looking for a press. I don't. Um, it, it was all inbound. And, and so that's how things maybe appear to be snowballing really fast, but internally it was the same old, same old. We were still 
looking for payroll every two weeks. We were still figuring out how do we raise another million dollars to invest in underrepresented founders. You know, we were still figuring our way out. How do we uh, let institutional investors know that it's time for us to have more assets under management? That's still to this day what we what we worry about and think about. So, yeah, uh, yeah it, it, a lot of it happened um, organically and, and then it fed off of itself. Well, congratulations, incredible story. And uh, it's an inspiration, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, for those who want to run funds like yours around the world. And um, really, really impressive. Let, let's shift to the book. Um, it's always interesting to understand from, from the perspective of the author, uh, it's about damn time, uh, the title. You know, a lot of authors go through a series of titles before they land on the one. You know, uh, what was so fitting about this title and how does it, how does it embody, you know, what you considered and, and, and where you landed? Yeah, I think it was 2018 again. So the book came out in May of this year and is still available at itsaboutdamntime.com if you want to check it out. And um, Amazon, rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. And so 2018, I just tweeted out, um, I, I, I definitely tweet a lot, uh, not not so much these days, you know, but I tweet a lot uh, back in 2018 for sure. And so often um, people kind of gave us type, like, told us what we were, told me what I was, or told backstage what we were, like as if they were sitting in our meetings, right? Uh, and a lot of times it was negative and a lot of times it was, or it was like passive, which is even worse in my opinion. It was kind of like a pat on the head sort of thing. And so I had just been seeing over and over again backstage was called a, um, a diversity fund. And that's not, there's nothing wrong with it being called that, but I, th I thought that it, people missed the message. They missed the, the point if they were just thinking, oh, this is a diversity fund instead of this is a fund with incredible founders and companies that have been overlooked for so long, finally getting you know, their shine and getting their due um, and also you know, competitively so and lucratively so. And so I, I tweeted out, they're calling it a diversity fund. I call it a, it's about damn time fund. And I just, it was just a random tweet. It was a thought in my mind. And because of the timing of it was around other press, it just took off. And so again, you know, that inbound uh, for, yeah. the, for the book, it was inbound and it was inbound interest. And so um, when, they, when I went to New York to, to meet with all of the different, uh, when I you know, had a, an, a, have an agent and went to meet with all of the different um, publishing houses, they're like, before I even walked in, they're like, we love this title. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's the title then. Yeah, that sounds good. Because it, it, it stands <laughs> the test of time because it is, right? It and is. it's just, yeah. it's funny because at one point, you know, I have these, these books behind me and I have about five of these shelves and I'm obsessed with books. I have books like on my couch that I have to place, you know, that have don't even fit yet. But um, at one point I just had just a row and I think I still have it over here. It's just a row of books that have the F word in it as a title, right? It's just a row of books that have the F word as the title and you see them in the airport. Uh, and it's just like, they're constantly selling really, really well. And I'm just like, so I used to joke with by the like the editors. I'm like, all we have to do is throw an F word in there and we're we're good. We're golden for a couple of years. And then I remembered, oh, I I I was raised by a black mother, so that's not gonna happen. Because <laughs> even at almost 40, she would she would whip me. <laughs> so uh, so I, I think it's like it's just it's just uh you know uh, edgy enough to get my point across and sh you know to seriously show the frustration that's there that so many people have of so often we're so, we're like relegated to this um, almost like a pet project for some people rather than we're toe to toe with you right uh, i think one of the again this is something i don't think i've said before uh, you bring it out of me eric <laughs> um, <laughs> One of the the uh, optional titles was um, came for the cake, not the crumbs, because I say that a lot. Yeah, you know. And then, but the reason I, I tell you honestly, you know, since you're my therapist now, uh, the reason that I didn't uh, choose that, or or even for the for a you know future book at this point, is because 
trolls will 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 take that title and run with it they'll be like yeah you should have stopped at the crumbs you know what i mean and so like i was just like envisioning three years of my life being made fun of for this title and i'm like nope can't do it <laughs> won't be able to survive uh the, the internets if i do this but i love the title and you know i do I too represent it everywhere i go yeah i love it um, i love the way you broke down the book too um you know really the early days with becoming money then talking about the big pillars, relationships, resilience, authenticity, creativity, and confidence. And I really like the last one around self-care. Um, you're, you're a big advocate of, of taking time. Um, um, how did you, like, why did you think this book needed to be written from your perspective? And how did these individual ideas come to you? Is it the way you live or are they things that came out as you, as you went on this, uh, you know, this journey? And I'll, I'll frame it up one last way. Um, Seth Godin, who I was corrected by Jerry Colonna yesterday said, uh, a book is uh, effectively, you know, a summary of an experience, you know, it's, and, and, you know, really take us into that experience that forged, forged the book and walk us through it. Yeah. So there's the several questions there, but, but yeah, it, it's, it's both um, lived like how I live and it's also, it came together. So what, one of the things that was really helpful was that I had a co-writer Rachel Nelson. And Rachel, I've known for, I still can't remember how many years, but it's, it's more than 15 years. So we've known each other for a long time. Um, she has, uh, just, she's just an amazing person. She's an amazing writer, although she had never written a book before, which was really fun to kind of, um, you know, not go in a traditional route and to have her as a, as a, as a, as a co-writer rather than a uh, ghostwriter. Because I really yeah. wanted to write this book, you know, I didn't want to just have it like say, oh, yeah, that looks nice. And then I'll we'll put my name on it, my face on it. That was not interesting to me whatsoever, no matter the amount of money that would come through. Uh, so having a co-writer who was a friend who could could be helpful, that was helpful. So what we did a lot at the early stages and what Rachel was so uh, incredibly helpful with uh, was like going through hours and hours of interviews that I have done, had done and writings and podcast episodes I had done myself. I mean, she had to go through all of this information and we just started pulling things, making sure that I had everything that I wanted to talk about kind of like in a, at a list, basically like a, a Google doc that we just kept open. And then, and then she would pull things and say, you know, this topic is just, I've heard you talk about this more than once. And this is a really interesting thing. Can you pull on that thread? So she would send me a prompt, it would be like a sentence or a, an idea that I had talked about before. And then she'd say, can you send me something? So I would just record audibly, you know, for 10 to 20 minutes, have it transcribed, send it back to her, and then we could, you know, flesh that out. And so that's how we did most of it. Uh, for some of the chapters, um, I, I typed them out um, and they just really flowed for me and they didn't, I didn't let them get touched because it was really important to me that they weren't. And then for the sections, that again was uh, not only Rachel and my input, but uh, Talia, our editor at Random House, um, really, she's like, she's really cool. And she like, I think Brad Feld was saying on Monday how his editor and he had become like really close. Like Talia is just mm -hmm. so intuitive. And I don't know any other way to do it. So I've never had a book before. So I don't know how else, you know, other, other editors work or when you don't have an editor, yeah. but. Talia has just been really helpful in kind of the heart of the matter, like, you know, advocating for the audience in most cases, instead of it being a, like a, you know, like cracking the whip, you know, it, it was more like, <laughs> no, let's just, uh, uh, you know, look at this from the audience perspective. So those, those eight, and, and, we, and, and actually those eight sections came together um, pre-sale. Uh, so we, we had those sections figured out early, early, early on. In the book, um, you often quote as having a handful of lessons in there that you like to talk about, the dangers of hustle porn, don't let anyone drink your Diet Coke, the best music comes from the worst breakups, or one that you spoke about uh, you know, with Ryan Harris earlier this week, let someone shorter than you stand in front of you. Um, in two questions, um, you know, you know, in your words, would lo you're such a great storyteller. Would love to have you tell you know one or two of those stories as it relates to the overall ethos of the book. And then two, um, what what new lessons would you add now that the book's been out and, and you've started to hear from your audience? Sure. So the first question um, 
um, you know, one of the one of the topics was the the standing in front of you. Let someone else stand, you know, shorter stand in front of you. And I'll I'll just mention that one again because you all are in Denver uh, and, and beyond, and Denver and Boulder and and Colorado in general, Aspen. You all have um, uh, such great music venues that are kind of this, this on the smaller side and, and kind of what I'm describing. So I think. It, if you have been to a concert or show that was standing room only, um, you might, or maybe you were in the pit or maybe you were in the general admission seats of, you know, a, a mixed room. And I'm, I'm from the touring world. So I was like dial in on that for some reason. But uh, if you've been to that type of concert, you may have either had this happen to you or been the person asking this question. Um, and you, and the question is like, you know, you, you someone is, you're, you're taller, someone is shorter, behind you can't see the stage just actually just happened to me uh just a few, like you know a few months ago right before uh quarantine um where some guy some guy was like taller than me so i did the, i did this experiment again usually when they tap you on the shoulder and you're in their way and you say hey can do you mind moving over five or six inches so i can just can i see the stage better like before the artist comes on uh usually nine times out of ten you're gonna have the person say, "Yeah, no problem. It's 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 easy. That that's easy for me." They they move over, you move up a little bit, or you're able to see the stage by staying where you are. And the point of it is, like the end of that, you realize that you didn't get any shorter. You didn't lose any height when you gave someone else <clears throat> a better view of the stage. And to me, that's like a really uh, simple example of sharing privilege of different types. And maybe you've been that person, or you, or you are the, or you're the person who, who's asked, or maybe both, like in my case. And uh, because we all have privilege, um, I think this fear of like losing some of that. I try to put myself in the mindset of people who have privilege who maybe been selfish with it, and I try to understand like if they're not just blatantly racist or sexist or homophobic, if they're not just blatantly that, you know, if they are like, that's nothing I want to work with. I'm not trying to mold that clay, you know, but if they're <laughs> just simply afraid of change or yeah. if they're simply like, they feel like literally and honestly feel like if they were to share, they would lose something. I try to get into that headspace and try to explain it. Um, to people, and I do this, I've done this for several years where I, where I talk to people one-on-one -on -one about it in a safe space for them, you know, because I do think that that has impact as well. When it comes to topics that uh, I would love to, I mean, I, I, I was so happy with the book because it got to tell so much of what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. I definitely have more stories to tell and, and more things to pull from those stories. And um, I can tell you that right now we're looking at book number two. Any, any, any teaser as to what, what, what it's about? Um, don't think I can um, <laughs> just yet, but it, it, if you like the first book, you'll really, really like this, this next book. Uh, you, I, I, we've made it so you like the, the premise of it is you don't necessarily have to have read the first book to, to be able to jump in but they definitely complement each other. And it's just my style and it's kind of, as with the first book, the whole idea was to um, get people ready to take what, what is theirs. Like this, you know, this book is about you getting what you are destined to have. Yeah. And I think the, I the one thing I can say about the next book is, is that it'll give you even more tools to do so. Oh, that's incredible. Well, audience, um, make sure you put your questions in chat. Um, we're going we're to go to your ask me anything questions uh, for Arlen Hamilton. Um, but one, one, one question on impact before we shift. Um, you know, clearly through your work, uh, you're a beacon for uh, underestimated and represented entrepreneurs worldwide. Um, what message do you really want to clearly deliver to those entrepreneurs loud and clear uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to the startup community? Oh, I, kind of what I just said before, which is, um, I'll say it as long as I have to. I hope one day I don't have to say it, but as long as I need yeah. to, as long as people need to hear it to, to feel this way, you do not need permission to, to partake and participate in what is already yours. You, do, you don't have to ask permission for what is already yours. Like we have all inherited the same space. You have an equal space. 
uh, in the tech world, in the investment world, and the uh, innov innovation world, in any industry you want to be in, um, tech or not, it is all yours. This is equally ours. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it, it, I don't. It's not for ours to pillage. It's not for ours to take more than than what has been set for us. But for so long. We have been left out uh, of, of the, I, I like think of it like you, you're left out of the reading of the will. Like you're <laughs> in the will, but you weren't allowed into the reading of it. And so you don't know that that's the, you have inherited that. And yeah. so a few people, a few siblings of ours have figured out this is supposed to go to all of us, but we're going to take it all. You need to jump yourself, you know, jump ahead in line and, and take over. And the way you do that is by building products, uh, building companies, uh, creating jobs for other people, bringing them along with you, creating your own uh, wealth and equity uh, by way of equity and, and, and continuing to re feed that into the ecosystem so that it's this, this, uh, uh, this cyclical uh, motion. And that's what I will be doing for the rest of my life. Incredible. We'll jump to some questions uh, from the audience. And um, looks like we got a lot of folks that are interested in uh, backstage capital and uh, you as a venture capitalist. Um, Barath asked the first question, um, what according to you, Arlen, uh, is the best way to start thinking and eventually becoming uh, a venture capitalist? Uh, you had that passion and you stepped in and created it. Where does one start if they eventually want to become a VC? Well, f first start with uh, making sure you want to become a venture capitalist. I had very specific reasons to go in this route Again, this this venture capital itself is 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 just a, a mechanism, a tool, uh, a, a one option of many. And so, first, figure out if you want to be a VC. In fact, I spoke at uh, Columbia uh, University a couple of years ago, or yeah, a couple of years ago now, and um, I was in a in a class full of venture future venture capitalists. That's what the course was, and I stood up there and told everybody, look. I don't think 80% of you should become VCs because some of you should, right? Some of you should, because that's where some, we need to have people in different places. But a lot of people uh, think they wanna be VCs and will realize how corporate it is and how yeah. kind of traditional and, and, and you know, uh, it's just old school, you know, even though it's supposed to be not, it's supposed to be innovative. So I would say, figure out if you want to be in VC and then also figure out, hey, if I do, but maybe I want to shake things up, kind of like what we were doing at Backstage. I want to shake things up and I want to do so for a purpose. What is that purpose? Our purpose was very clear when we started out. What is your purpose? And then so start walking towards that that light. And there are a lot of, um, I would say definitely read my book if you haven't yet, because I talk a lot about that and, and will continue to through authorship. Um, and and there are a few uh, interviews you can listen to where I talk you know in depth about starting a fund. And there are now, um, even before COVID hit, there, there are now these different courses you can take. Like for instance, Brad Feld, we talked about him a couple of times, he had he and, and and Jason Mendelson have a, an online course. Uh, I think it, it it starts every few months. I'm not sure exactly the cadence of it, but check that out. It's like VC. You know, his book Venture Capital 101 is a book that I learned on, uh, uh, and they kind of take that and turn it into a course. There's also the National Venture Capital Association (NVCA). Um, they have a I believe every quarter they start a new quarterly course. And um, and so like just jumping into to things like that where you don't necessarily have to go out and go to like you know hundred thousand dollar schools or get an MBA or do any of that at first you can dip a toe learn about it more learn more about what it really is see who the players are and and then start making your way and I think that online learning is just like the key right now it's just so clutch right now. Next question alongside uh, being an investor as well. Elizabeth asks, asks uh, I've been a fan since I've uh, heard your series on startup. Uh, can you talk a little about what qualities you look for in founders when deciding to invest and understanding hard work and resilience are key. How do you evaluate those uh, aspects in founders? Yeah, they are key. Um, 
there, there are different people on our team who do different things and have different ways of evaluating, which is, I think is, is very smart and, um, and, and key as well. Um, part of this, a lot of this, I think is like humility because a lot of times when you ask different investors, how are they making investment decisions? They'll like break out all kinds of like spreadsheets and this product, this and that and the other. And we in fact have a, a process that we go through. We kind of uh, label things one to five on these different topics. You know, how did they rank on this and that? You'll see that with demo days. We do that internally a lot of times, especially with our accelerator. But ultimately, I made a decision a couple of years, maybe three years ago, that I was going to always follow instinct over anything, over data, um, no, even, no matter how much we had under management. Like, even if that meant that we had a billion dollars under management, but I was only allowed to play with, you know, 2% of it because I was only going by gut, whatever that was going to be, because I, the humility to say that none of us are uh, mind readers, none of us can see the future. I. I can imagine the future and I walk towards what I want that future to look like, but none of us know for sure what's going to happen. Did any of us predict this year, last year, any of us, right? So though, so yes, I look at, uh, I look at uh, uh, hard work and, and resiliency and maybe not even hard work. I think it's more like smart work, mm -hmm. by the way, like hard work doesn't really do anything for me, but smart work does a lot. Resilience um, but also it is in seeing what they have done so far. Like, this is a big thing. And I say this all the time and I think people just glaze over it. This is it. This part is it. I want to see what you've done with what you've had. It is a huge marker for me. It's the same way that people plug in data and they come out with this printout of, okay, this is probably going to 10 X. I do that mentally with, Someone, every time someone, it's the first thing you can think about because it helps you decide, you know, with whatever your taste is and whatever your, your in, inner kind of compass is, it helps you decide what you believe is the potential of that person. Think of, it's just a straightforward, like a straightforward uh, a view of it. So it doesn't have to be what you've done with the certain company that you're working on, especially if you're early, but what have you, what have you done with what you've had under your circumstances? What have you done? And then is it, is it, does, do I feel like I can help accelerate that by anything that I could do? And so, so many people come to me and, and, and they are like, I have this idea and that's where it stops. And I'm like, you know what? I thought of DoorDash, Uber and Airbnb before they all happened. I had an idea too, but here we are. <laughs> I don't have any equity in any of those, do I? <laughs> because ideas are just that. But what have, what have you done, even if it's the, 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 t the smallest thing, but in your circumstances, it was the biggest thing to you? Next question comes from Sean. Um, you know, what steps did you take to become this expert in your field? And what advice do you have for people who don't know what direction they want to take in their career to really find that mastery or becoming an expert? Yeah, the, the first chapter of my book uh, is about, it's called, you know, it's, I can't remember what it's called, but it's about um, becoming money, becoming the asset. So what did I do and what advice do I give is all yeah. sorts of what you have in control is like the information that you have that you can gain, that you can research. Like the, I put in all this research to uh, what what I have now. I think, you know, there is a, there was a woman I, I talked about this yesterday uh, somewhere, so it reminded me of it. There was a woman who had just left like a big high profile job in Silicon Valley and then went to get her MBA a couple of, like three years ago, we had lunch. We had an hour lunch in Los mm -hmm. Angeles and she was from San Francisco. And we had this lunch and we were talking about her. She wanted to build a fund. She wanted to create a fund and she's gone on to do so. And at the end of the hour, she said, I just got my MBA. And I learned more in this lunch than I had, than I learned in that entire MBA class and course. And the reason I was able to tell her so much and give her so much like tactical information and, and yes, become an expert in my opinion on this topic of building a fund is because of those three and a half years where I was getting not $1 brought in. 
I never stopped learning and studying and researching and keeping up with the what was happening on a daily basis and learning about the history so I could learn what to repeat and what not to repeat. So I absolutely, if, if you're trying to become an expert or if you're just trying to break into something and you haven't spent every waking moment that you have that's an extra, again, not working hard, but working smart, bringing in that information, then, then you, you, there's, this is the day to start doing that. And uh, so that's my advice and that's what I did to do that. And then from the moment I got the first check, that first wire, uh, I never stopped. So this morning and every morning uh, of the week, not the weekends because I try to have those boundaries, every morning of every week, I do a, uh, a, a, a kind of a download of things that I want to understand. And then I get into my long day and then I kind of end the day understanding more stuff. And uh, I print things out when I need to. I have PDFs going when I need to. You never get complacent. Never get complacent. Never get complacent. It's good advice. Um, Amy asks, um, has anyone previously or seemingly dismissed you later to circle back to restart the dialogue and initiate working together? And, and how did you handle it? And, and what were some of those opportunities? Happens all the time. All the time. There's a, there was a woman who... Um, I remember like in 2016 or something, and I, I'm, it's a little petty, but I just remember it because I remember, you know, <laughs> slights. And I remember being, I was at this, this it was like an intimate um, meetup, probably 50 or so people. And it's like a restaurant or bar or whatever it was out yeah. in San Francisco. And I saw this woman who I'd been like researching and studying about, and I had already started investing, but I was super early. And I was just like, so happy to see her. And so I was, and it was an intimate thing. So it was like invite only. So it was like, there was a little vetting that already happened. It wasn't like I was a, a complete stranger. And I went up to her and somebody else was with me who kind of knew my story and knew what was going on. And I was, you know, very humbly saying, you know, I, I just love your work and I'd love to talk to you about what I'm doing. And this was after I had the, you know, I had the ability to, to have those conversations with other people. I just didn't say that like do you know who I am sort of thing because that would be stupid <laughs> so she was like oh yeah okay and because she didn't know me at the time she just like beelined it and just went somewhere else and just wouldn't give me the time of day and it felt really it felt bad and something must have happened where somebody must have sent her something or she came across an article within weeks she was chasing me on email, chasing me. Can I, can I, can I take you out to lunch? Can I do this? Can I do that? And, and I promise you again, Petty, uh, Tom Petty over here, um, <laughs> did not once go to lunch with her <laughs> because I was like, nah, nah, that's good. We're good. Because a lot of times what happens is, um, you know, that saying, you know, you're going to, you're going to meet the same people going up the ladder as you do going down the ladder. You're going to meet the same people. And, and so a lot of times, you know, um, that has happened it's it's happened with it's happened every year since i started and more and more now especially now because of all of the attention and it's just you know it's it's um i don't like look at the attention as anything to 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 brag about it's you know i still do my day-to-day -day work every day but because of that that amplification out there in the other in the in the surreal world uh people think that they need to be in my orbit and so they people will just kind of fall over themselves to to try to get back in my good graces and I'm just like you know I got a really cool like cool friends who were there before I had anything yeah. I also have a lot of people who I love investing in who didn't know me before but you know that's where I'm spending my time it's like with really authentic people not someone who looks at me as a transaction uh let's stay in there for a second Spin your time with deep authentic people like um when you think about the thousands of people that come through your email you know how, how, how are you sorting through those and you know where, where do you spend your time yeah so i get about two or three thousand emails a week and I come, of course a lot of that spam oh. i get i have to you know sort through it um i have a great um team within backstage it's called arlen was here team yeah. and uh, consists of chacho and jamie uh and, and rachel and 
they help me, uh, in addition to what the other things that Chacho does at the investment firm, they help me sort through all of that. Um, but I am also kind of a paranoid person. So I, nobody has access to my email. Like I, I just, you know, handle all my email, all my social. Um, I, I have boundaries for myself yeah. and I have made it very clear to myself that I can't be everything to everyone. I can't say yes to everything. Certainly. I mean, I say no to 80% of things of requests. I can't fix everything and I can't save everything and I have a savior complex. So that was really hard to, to, to get to, to figure out. But understanding that means that there are going to be emails that I don't get to, that I don't get to yeah. read. I try to read as much as I can if I don't, even if I don't respond, so I can at least have it. But I do what I can as the human that I am with the time that I have, knowing how many things I have in a, in a given day. In a given day, I'm probably working on anywhere from 40 to 60 different topics that have their own. Oh. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's wow. full on. Like this morning before yeah. now, we started at what, 10 a.m. Uh, LA time. Yep. I woke up at eight, which I try to do every day because I try to get eight hours sleep. I woke, woke up at eight. I had four different topics and I just kind of told uh, my team that I'm working on four different things between 8.30 and 10. And they were... Um, they were about a, a new fund that I fund idea that I have. So I was talking to a, a stakeholder in that. They were about um, uh, someone uh, joining BackstageCrowd.com, uh, which is our investment syndicate, but also joining my all access membership that I have, which is a very specific thing uh, for income. Um, and then, you know, two other topics that were that were, oh, one was about a podcast that I'm working on. Uh, and then, you know, another topic. And so. Busy. Yeah, so that, that's yeah. going to, so With when smart work. Over, I will have, you know, 36 more topics to think about, 35 more topics to think about. And incredible. It, it's, it's difficult because some people will get upset and they'll say, I, I, you know, I thought you were different. I thought you were going to respond to me or I've had, I've actually had people like in the street, like come up to me and say that they were upset with me because I didn't get back to their email three years ago. And I can't <laughs> let that get me. I can't. It's yeah. just impossible. So I just say, think of all the good things that you are able to accomplish in a day. What another little hack is that I have the team do sometimes and that I do all the time. Everybody can do this. Starting tomorrow morning or even starting today, go into a draft email and just start doing bullet points of things that you accomplish. Just little things. You know, I, I did write back to that person or I did finish this thing I was supposed to do. Make a little list and do it for a week. And have it going and real quick, you know, don't take too much time. Go back at the end of the week and just look at everything that you do in a given day, in a given week. And then don't be so hard on yourself. Good you know, advice. Give yourself a break. Well, uh, you're a woman that does uh, an incredible amount for the industry, um, for you. And then most importantly, you know, uh, for all the entrepreneurs out there working to build things that uh, you've inspired. So uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, one last question. Um, as we as we look out uh, a year from now, you've got a lot going on. You mentioned you know new fund, new book, uh, podcasts, uh, uh, Arlen Inc. Um, what are we celebrating a year from now that you're most excited about? If we if, if we got back together at the same time, what are we toasting to? I think we're toasting to. Um backstage still being ex in existence which is always a beautiful thing because it's so hard <laughs> to do <laughs> we're toasting to probably at least one exit from our portfolio that we were very proud of being a part of um we're toasting to the people on our team um continue continuing to elevate uh their careers and uh probably my my next book is in pre-sale at the least and uh maybe what? Maybe there's there's something that's happened on television, maybe. <laughs> You're amazing. Well, we're so blessed to have you as part of Startup Week. You've been an incredible, incredible, generous uh, participant, um, having participated in a multitude of sessions this week. Um, we love your story. Uh, we love your work. We love your heart for entrepreneurs around the world. And Arlen, um, from, from Denver to the rest of the planet, um, a huge, generous thank you for all that you're doing for uh, all the uh, underestimated and underrepresented entrepreneurs in the planet uh, with your vision, your work, and your fund. Um, blessing, you so blessing to have you here. And thank you so much. 
Thank you. I appreciate you, Eric, and everybody at Denver Startup Week. Um, I also want to give one more shout out to the ASL interpreters. I didn't catch their names this time, um, but uh, just the whole week has just been incredible with this interpretation. Just really rock solid. I mean, obviously I can't read it, but I also just to keep up with like my wacky brain <laughs> is, uh, is something else. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, audience, um, Denver Startup Week, uh, wherever you may be, thank you so much for tuning in today. Um, we can't wait. Um, we have our, our, uh, our final author in our Innovation Author Showcase, Elliot Pepper, with his book, Veil, uh, tomorrow, um, who's just an incredible novelist, uh, has written nine novels, and we're going to talk about his most recent work, Veil, tomorrow. Um, a huge shout out again to MAPR Agency for their constant work and dedication to making this entire series come to life, and to all of our sponsors of Denver Startup Week. Uh, who made this a reality. Thank you, thank you, thank you um, for building the community of the future right here in Denver. Um, so till next, till tomorrow at 11, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tune in and see you then. Thank you so much. <laughs>